Good evening and welcome to the program. I'm Leland Vitter. It turns out Republicans and Democrats agree January 6th and the issues surrounding it are good for firing up their base. A little later, we're going to show you both sides' playbook for tomorrow's anniversary. Plus, why tonight's $630 million Powerball jackpot is stacked against you in ways you don't even know. And we're going to show you the big lie that your lottery funding, your lottery dollars goes to funding education. But we start tonight in America. We start in Chicago, where the city's 340,000 kids got an unexpected day off from school, much to the chagrin of their parents who got the announcement at 9.30 last night and had to scramble for child care amid a winter storm. Today, though, wasn't a snow day. Chicago Public Schools canceled class because their teachers didn't feel like coming to work. I say feel because it wasn't a strike or a sick out. They voted to simply stay home rather than teach in person, claiming it isn't safe to be in the classroom, a statement contrary to science and, as one parent pointed out, contrary to Democratic politicians who usually loathe crossing the teachers' unions. Every public health expert, the president of the United States, the secretary of education, our mayor, CPS CEO, I can go down the list. There's one group that does not want to be in school. Chicago isn't alone. More than 4,700 schools around the country are closed because of COVID, but Chicago is unique. Last night, the union voted to defy the Chicago public schools and the mayor and their contract and stay home. For the past few days, we have invited every remote learning school shutdown enthusiast, union president we can find to come on the show. Here's a list of all of the groups and pictures of some that we have reached out to. We've invited representatives from the teachers unions. We have offered them to let them send their lawyers. It's telling they all say no. That said, we are going to do our level best to fairly represent throughout the next 10 or 12 so minutes their side of the story. The unions won a whole host of concessions, including massive surveillance testing of students and remote learning circuit breakers, something the city calls impossible demands to return to the classroom. And the union offers no guarantees their demands won't change over time. The teachers union in Chicago put out this tweet. West Side schools are facing a staggering 35% COVID positivity rate with at least a dozen staffers and 40 to 60% of students out in many buildings post winter break. For that, they picked one small area of the city and cherry picked data. Even when you read the tweet, it's pretty unclear exactly what the math means. But one thing is clear. It's hard to see in that tweet a sincere desire to get back to the classroom and educate Chicago's kids. So let's look at the risk to teachers from a vaccinated and boosted teacher. Student, the chance of you, a teacher dying, is roughly 1 in 1.5 million. There are 3.7 million teachers in America or the size of Los Angeles. So that means if you could guarantee remote learning would protect every teacher in America from COVID, you'd save four lives. The four people who died would most likely be already sick, very sick with something else. In Chicago, there are 25,000 teachers. Statistically, staying at home will not prevent a single death. The risk to kids cut off from in-person learning, often left at home for hours with no supervision, is very real. Parents have known this since the beginning of the pandemic. Remote learning is crippling an entire generation, all the more so for minorities and the poor. Shutting down schools is effectively shutting down society for children. That is their life. So we shouldn't talk about not shutting down if we're shutting down schools. Hmm. Think about it. We used to have doctors on TV to talk about the dangers of COVID. Now we have doctors on TV to talk about the risk to kids from teachers unions using COVID is an excuse not to work. Never before have so many, the children of America, been asked to sacrifice so much for so few. In this case, they're teachers who are supposed to have the kids' best interests at heart. President Biden's education secretary, a former teacher and principal himself, says enough is enough. Here he is on Rush Hour earlier today. Well, look, as a parent and as an educator, I know our children learn best in the classroom. And I can tell you, as someone who was uh, there trying to open schools uh, before we had vaccines and before we had the access to testing we have today, uh, that it was important to do it then, and it's even more important to do it now. Teachers unions in the Democratic Party are historically like a cup of coffee and a sunrise. They just go together. We're going to go to get into 
what this means for the power of unions and the political partners, the Democratic Party soon, because there is now a big split. But what happens in big cities often continues to the rest of America, which makes the fight here in Chicago so important. We start with Anna Devalantis, longtime Chicago investigative reporter, TV anchor, friend of the show. Uh, Anna, it's good to see you. You talked to Lori Lightfoot, who just a couple of months ago was ready to fire police officers who didn't get vaccinated. Is she ready to fire teachers who are calling this strike sick out, whatever you want to call it? I think she's ready to, Leland, and good to see you. You laid that out perfectly. I don't think she is able to, given to the state legislature's recent moves that gave teachers' unions more powers than they already had. It makes her hands tied in these kinds of situations. But I got to tell you, Leland, uh, parents are losing their minds right now for the reasons you just laid out. Teachers' unions are saying it's simply unsafe to be in the schools. All of them, all 600 of them, not one of them safe enough. The problem is no one in the healthcare world agrees with them. Not one epidemiologist, not the heads of city and health and the county health departments, not the Biden administration, as you point out, who's, is, is uh, there... who's given $130 billion to try to fund the schools so that they're ready for this very moment. They're saying, even the Biden administration is saying, we're ready for the surge, yeah. we can do this. Now, some schools might need to close, but you don't need to close a whole, a whole school system right. for a, at a time like this. You have to think about it. You don't ever want to be pejorative, and you always want to give people the benefit of the doubt. It's hard to when they won't come on and answer questions and when they won't submit themselves to interviews as, as everybody else does and as uh, Lori Lightfoot did, uh, did with you. But it, it, you almost have to get to this basic answer that it's like they're just lazy. They're doing this because they can you know, I come from a family of educators and I know how difficult that job can be. I think sometimes the unions get to a point where they no longer represent all members. Did have a 73% vote though, Leland, to, to, to take this kind of action. The fact that they can take this action in defiance of the science, I think is what boggles the minds of so many people. And yes, I had an opportunity to sit down with the mayor today, the mayor of Chicago, Mayor Lightfoot. She rarely gives these kinds of interviews. And I said, well, why is it that teachers get to decide, well, I wanna be remote or I wanna shut down the schools. Why isn't it more possible yeah. I, I mean, for I'm you interested to do something? Yeah, no, it, it's interesting about, about that interview because because Lori Lightfoot's been so outspoken on so many issues, um, and at a time when you really need leadership, she's now kicking it to the parents. Take a listen. We really need parents' voices um, in this um, debate because the CTU doesn't get the right to take the choice uh, from parents. It doesn't, and we can't let that happen. If it happens now, where does it end? Woman who was a federal prosecutor. She took on the police union, continues to take on the police union. Why is she able to take on the police union and not the teachers union? Well, you're right, Leland. She did tell the police, uh, police union when they said, we're not going to go along with bye bye your vax mandate that, we, we, OK, I'll move to put you on no pay status and I'll move to fire you as well. I asked her that very question. Why not do that? Here, if you feel that this is totally in defiance of what should be and the science is not on the side and all of your health officials are telling you that they're wrong here, flat out wrong, and the children are suffering because of it, her answer was more about her powers to do it. I feel as if she might make that kind of a move or the same kind of threat she had with police, but she can't. Legislature well, has she, she, how made about, moves to, to limit you, her power. Yeah, and you, you've been a reporter in this town for an awfully long time. Um, and a, a great investigative reporter. It, it's one thing to say, well, I can't, or you know, maybe I can, or you know, the, it's up to the parents to make their voices heard. It's another thing to just do it and let the courts figure it out. It would certainly be a pretty serious shot across the bow, right? You would think so. They are in mediation with them. They're, I mean, they're at the bargaining table trying to work through this. But it is so clear, Leland, as you pointed out in your open, that the teachers union has the upper hand and they know it. And so those negotiations become uh, just total frustration for the city because they just don't have the power to move the needle the way they need yeah. to or uh, or wield the, wield the sword if they, yeah. if they wanted to. This is the vice president of the teachers union uh, explaining their position as much as she could. This new variant is also affecting the vaccinated and the boosted. We're going to fight for the mitigations, set up testing here, regular testing. Okay, I, I guess, have you figured out from the teachers union, 
we get it the kids are not in school now, but have they laid out how kids can get back to school and stay in school? Yeah, I think it has to do with right now, testing is one of the big things that the teachers union wants. So you want, uh, what, 340,000 students to be tested every single week. I think at a time we all know that testing is not exactly easy to find, that's going to be nearly impossible to accomplish. So it's one of those things you throw out there. Um, and yes, they had some problems in CPS with the testing they did send home. I know you've reported it on News Nation throughout the day today, and it's that was unfortunate. But not every school is dealing with the kinds of staffing shortages right. that should shut down a school. Yeah. And I think it could yeah. be left up to individual yeah, schools. Yeah, well, yeah, it's the straw man. You, you lay out some impossible demand of, you know, well, if you can't test everybody every day or every week, then we can't teach and be safe. Well, okay. Shows you sort of where your where the motivations are, and a great interview. Uh, we're going to play a little bit more of your interview with Lori Lightfoot about the crime in Chicago and some of the political issues of, around crime that really mm -hmm. affect the country nationwide. Uh, later in the show, awesome work. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Leland. Yeah, thank Good to you. See you. Few things are more politically linked than Democratic politicians and teachers unions. Here is a tweet from just a few months ago by the president of the largest teachers union. Nothing quite like introducing an NEA, National Educators Association, member who also happens to be the first lady of the United States. Teachers Union showed up for President Biden in 2020, and he promised at that convention and during that speech to pay them back. The American people saw it. They get it. And they understand what you've been saying for years, that you are professionals, all of you, all of you. All of us have a responsibility to make sure that you have what you need to educate our children safely, equitably, and well. There are no permanent allies in politics, and President Biden is abandoning the unions for a more powerful constituency, parents, specifically suburban moms, who really want their kids in school. Carrie McDonald specializes in child policy, is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute Center for Educational Freedom. Akash. Shogli, Vice President of Americans for Prosperity. Nice to see uh, both of you. Uh, Carrie, are we to believe that uh, the Democratic Party and the teachers unions are, are on a break or actually broken up? Well, you know, I think, Leland, we've learned for a long time that uh, the Democratic Party and the teachers unions are very tightly knit. And I think for the first time, perhaps a lot of parents are realizing just how connected these organizations are. Uh, and certainly with regards to school closures, uh, I think this is really the last straw you had in your last segment. Uh, talking about Chicago being closed. But as of Monday, more than 2,000 schools across the country were closed, uh, and some of them not sure when they'll be reopened. So I think parents have really had enough and are, in particular, in Chicago and other places, seeing uh, the true influence and impact of teachers' unions on school policy. Yeah, we're, we're now at 4,500 uh, for this week. Uh, Akosh, how, how do school choice advocates like yourself uh, take advantage of this? Because the union still, as is, is the mayor pointed out, still control a lot of the state legislature and can't even be fired for this. That's right. The case has simply never been more obvious than it's been made the last two years, Leland. You know, your segment with Anna just walked through what happens when you are in a situation like the case in Chicago where the union is the most powerful political machine, they help elect politicians, and then they sit across the table from those politicians and negotiate their contracts they have the protection from the state legislature in Illinois, and this is what happens. And so what we need to be doing is putting families in control. There's no reason now that states and local governments are flush with cash that we can't have dollars follow students, put families in control, and allow kids to get the education they deserve, that they need, that their families think is right for them, the demand of the teachers' union yeah. notwithstanding. Yeah, Carrie, we've, we've seen now how teachers' unions and school boards are playing such a role in people's lives. We saw it play a huge role uh, in the Virginia gubernatorial election. Uh, it's still early, very early, but are we starting to see any line shift in terms of the Democratic Party? Well, you know, I think for sure um, politicians are paying attention to parents uh, and parents have really found their voice over the past nearly two years now as they've 
gotten a close up look at what's happening in their children's classrooms through remote schooling throughout 2020 and are continually frustrated by school closures and various COVID policies in their classrooms. You know, I think uh, in some ways they're pushing for school choice policies and expanded legislation to allow tax dollars to follow students instead of systems, um, but they're also voting with their feet. I mean, we had NPR reporting, for example, that for, uh, that in Chicago, for example, 14,000 students left the district last year, another mm. 10,000 students left the district this year. That's true of public school districts across the country, particularly large urban ones. Uh, lots of yeah. families moving to homeschooling, which doubled in uh, population last year, continues to be um, a popular option for families. So parents yeah. are, I think, using this combination of voice and exit to get their uh, to get their message out. Oh, if, and that's for those who can leave. Obviously, the, and the studies have shown this, that the, the kids who are getting hurt the worst through all these shutdowns are uh, blacks, Hispanics, uh, and the, the poorest among us. Um, it, it's interesting how, and I, I don't want to use the word arrogant, but shall we say emboldened uh, the teachers unions are, that they'll even sort of explain outright uh, how they view the world. Take a listen. NEA and its affiliates are effective advocates because we have power. And we have power because there are more than 3.2 million people who are willing to pay us hundreds of millions of dollars in dues each year. Okay, that's pretty clear. Uh, Akosh, uh, what's the chance that the Democratic Party and the teachers unions make up here in the next I don't know, six months before the elections, and then isn't that an opportunity lost for folks like you? It is. I mean, you know, we need to be taking advantage. And when I say we, to Carrie's point, this isn't just people that work in public policy. These are families, lawmakers, need to be taking advantage of what's been made available, where it is available. And you're seeing in states like Florida, Arizona, they're expanding choice for families, putting families in control, and that's great news. Now, to your point about the politics, Leland, I mean, I don't expect this at all to be a permanent divorce. You mentioned that, um, you know, in, in, in that clip, the teachers unions get millions and millions of dollars, which for years wasn't the teachers were necessarily willing, but rather they were forced to pay hundreds of dollars in dues to the union, which they in turn spent on politics. So it really is a vicious cycle. But mm -hmm. now is the time to be calling for choice for families to put families in control so, again, kids are not beholden to the whims of teachers' unions. Yeah, we've yet to see, we've seen President Biden say, hey, kids can go back, it's safe. We've seen some Democratic governors, Democratic mayors. We've yet to see any major Democratic politicians really attack the teachers' unions. Uh, that would be a uh, watershed moment, and one which, obviously, uh, I know you guys will be uh, watching for. Akosh uh, and Kerry, it was good to see both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Leland. Yeah, thanks. Both Democrats and Republicans are using the January 6th anniversary to fire up their base. Both sides are. We're going to show you how. Plus, big city crime hitting record highs. Our mayors are fighting with prosecutors and police. But we're going to show you how the infighting between all the local officials is just making things worse. Welcome back. 2021 was the deadliest year in a quarter century in Chicago, America's third largest city. 836 people were murdered, the most since 1996. It comes after the 2020 crime surge where nearly 800 people were killed. 2022 isn't much better. By the time the sun rose on New Year's Day, police were investigating three murders. Today, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, who's been at odds with the police, pointed her finger at prosecutors and judges for allowing violent offenders on electronic monitoring rather than throwing them in jail. And anybody who tells me that it's okay for 90 murderers and 2,300 total violent, dangerous people to be walking our streets, I haven't heard a single person who sees these numbers and says, yeah, this is okay. I can't stand silent when the Cook County criminal justice system keeps throwing these violent, dangerous people right back out into the street. Lightfoot went on to say that Chicago needed more police and was struggling to recruit. Can't imagine why they're having a hard time recruiting. Lightfoot pushed back on officers saying they don't have enough support from the mayor's office. Well, I know that that is a, a narrative that's out there, certainly propagated by the current leadership of FOP, who's focused on division and not uh, addition, not building unity and common ground. 
but I, I just have to say that's not the case. But if you look at what we've done, the resources that we put in uh, to things like officer wellness, I say this all the time, we've got to do a better job of thanking our officers. Yeah, there's a lot of police officers in Chicago I've talked about who would talk to who would disagree with the mayor, but it's not just Chicago seeing a crime surge. Philadelphia has hit 562 murders last year, the most reported in any year in history. But amid record homicides, the city's prosecutor, Larry Krasner, is doubling down, not on fighting crime, but social justice. This after Krasner was slammed last month for saying Philly did not have a crime problem, a comment he later walked back. Selena Zito, Washington Examiner political reporter, joins us uh, now. All right, Selena, where, where nationally is this conversation? Because it doesn't seem as though there's a collective response from progressive Democrats realizing what a political problem this is. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You don't you don't see that message coming out. However, if you talk to local Democrats, in particular Democrats who uh, work in local government, whether it's the mayor's office or the state or the county, uh, they're deeply concerned about this, but they don't actually want to come to blows with these prosecute with the prosecutors. So what you saw happen a couple weeks ago in Philadelphia is the former mayor Michael Nutter, who is black, grew up in West Philly. He just came out, you know, guns blazing in terms of just saying enough is enough. This is the, the majority of the people, it's over 80% of the people that have have died in, in this historic year of, of gun violence has have been black. And and he's just, he, I think he called it woke politics uh, from a white liberal. I mean, he didn't, he didn't hold back on this. And he said what, what a lot of, uh, yeah, you, you, you think about you, you think about though you've got the Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg who says he's going to stop seeking prison sentences for criminals. Uh, basically, you only get felony charges for armed robbery, drug dealing, and murder is the only reasons you go to jail. Uh, you've got Kim Fox uh, in Chicago who Lori Lightfoot's pointing the finger at. You've got the guy that we just talked about uh, in Philadelphia. How is it that they still? have power and stay in office? Because the Democrats have not sort of figured out how to navigate this issue. They're not quite sure what, where they're supposed to be on it. They, they don't, you know, in, in particular white politicians, uh, they believe that they are supposed to have this sort of certain sentiment uh, to to connect themselves with the with the black population. However, if you talk to the residents in Philadelphia, and I did, in um, uh, uh, in particular the black residents, the, these policies are not something they ever wanted. They were able to separate their sentiments about what happened to George Floyd, and also be able to be supportive of their local mm. beat cop. And and but but progressives sort of didn't know how to navigate that, yeah, and it, they've caused a problem for their own constituencies. It will, well, certainly the problem for the constituencies in Chicago and Philadelphia and New York are very real. How do we square the circle then that Eric Adams won in New York on this law and order platform, and yet you've got a new DA who says he's going to not charge people with felonies and only murderers get jail time? Yeah, that's the challenge for Adams. That's a challenge for the mayor in Philadelphia because they 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 don't agree with them, but they also don't want to spar with them. And so they're sort of just stuck in the mud. I'm mm -hmm. I'm really interested to see how Adams handled this. I covered his I covered him very early on in New York and and saw him you know, sort of his message being uh, very um, uh, accepted by New Yorkers. It was it was refreshing, uh, but it, it's and, and and he beat out uh, the sort of uh, woke side. Yeah, I mean, he, he beat out he beat out a bunch of super progressive, soft on right. crime, social justice folks with this law and order message, and then you've got this prosecutor with clearly a very right. different view. Hey, Selena, unfortunately, we got to run. Um, we do see the prosecutor and the mayor and the police chief at war here in Chicago. Hard to imagine how any of that ends well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, good to see you. The Powerball jackpot is now $630 million, but your chances to win are even worse than you think. We're going to show you how the rules of the game have changed, something that you weren't told much about.
turns out Republicans and Democrats agree. January 6th and the issues surrounding it are good for firing up their base. Democrats tomorrow will use the January 6th images in the anniversary. Going forward, they're going to use all of these images and the ads that they can make from them as a reminder of what can happen when Donald Trump is in office. And not just Trump. They'll warn you any Republican running for election in 2022 is one step closer to another January 6th. Meantime, the MAGA crowd, especially Trump disciple candidates in contested primaries, will use the 2020 election and the rioters' complaints, President Trump's complaints at the rally before the riot, to prove their loyalty to Team MAGA. Tomorrow, you'll see Democrats at various vigils and events. The president and vice president will head to the Capitol. Some media organizations are planning wall-to-wall 9-11-style anniversary coverage, with CNN taking over Statuary Hall inside the Capitol for their special coverage. Exclusive on the anniversary of January 6th, the police, the lawmakers, and the leaders fighting for accountability. An unprecedented gathering. Jake Tapper and Anderson Cooper host live from the Capitol, January 6th, one year later, tomorrow at 8. Republican leadership in the House and Senate have other plans. They will be at the funeral for Johnny Isaacson of Georgia, planned for 2 p.m. tomorrow in Atlanta. With that, we bring in Niall Stanage. He will be on Capitol Hill tomorrow, White House columnist for our partners uh, at the Hill. Uh, I don't want to be cynical, and of course, no res- disrespect to Johnny Isaacson, a gentleman in, in every sense of the word. He died on December 19th. Are we to believe that the scheduling of his funeral for 2 p.m. on January 6th uh, is a coincidence? I don't think so, Leland. That would be quite a stretch as coincidences go. As you say, he was a gentleman. He was very well respected. But look, the political reality is that Republican leadership is not unhappy about having a solemn and serious pretext to avoid being on Capitol Hill and getting dragged into this debate about how they should mark the anniversary of those events. Yeah, it seems as though Speaker Pelosi is literally packed her schedule to mark the events. Uh, This is her schedule for tomorrow. 10 a.m. moment of reflection, 12 p.m. statement and moment of silence, 1 p.m. conversation with historians, 2.30 members testimonials, 5.30 prayer vigils. One could imagine she's going to work in some interviews uh, somewhere in there. Do Democrats view anytime they can mention January 6th simply as a proxy for reminding their base about how bad Donald Trump is? I think there are two ways of looking at that, Leland. I do think that there is actually sincere shock, not just in Democratic ranks, although primarily so, about what happened on January the 6th. So I just want to be clear that I'm not suggesting this is all confected. Now, at the same time, no politician or person is completely pure. Do Democrats see some potential political advantage in tying Republican candidates as closely as possible to what happened on January the 6th and to former President Trump. Yes, I I think they do. And I think we'll see them do that tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never seen a politician show up at one, two, three, four, five events in a day if they didn't think there was a political advantage to be gained from it on either side. That's just what politicians do and how they, they do their schedule. It's interesting, though, you say about tying Republicans to the issues surrounding January 6th, there's at least a number of Republicans who who don't wrap themselves in January 6th, but they wrap themselves in the issues surrounding January 6th. This is an Arizona GOP candidate for Secretary of State. Take a listen. We've got to get rid of mail-in ballots because it's the bane of our existence. Hey, there's an easy solution to that. Get off the list. Go to the polls. Because the more people who get off the list and go to the polls, that universe of ballots begins to shrink. And with a smaller universe, the potential for fraud is going to pop right out. This is the cost of telling thousands of people that there is a legitimate shot of overturning the election. Okay, so we got a little mixed up there, but the Secretary of State with his initial soundbite there, the, or the candidate should, should say, not to get into mail-in ballots, but what, is it the Republican base and the primary base, or is it Republicans as a whole who view election, election integrity, in air quotes, as a real motivator? 
I have certainly spoken to Republicans who say that on the doorsteps or in engaging with constituents that a lot of, um, shall we say, conservative-leaning voters do take this issue of election security or election integrity or whatever phrase you want to use very seriously, and, and they do see that as a really live issue. Now, as you're well aware, Leland, it's one of these issues that there's a complete schism in the nation about because Democrats clearly believe that Republicans are trying to suppress the vote and Republicans clearly believe Democrats are trying to uh, essentially loosen the rules. Um, and so th th it's one of those situations where the two political tribes are existing in different universes, I think. Yeah, it's very easy to, to listen to Republicans on this issue and Democrats on this issue. I think they're talking about two separate things. Interestingly enough, President Biden is going down to Georgia to talk about a federal election law. Most of the Republican laws, obviously, are, are at the state level. Uh, what are you going to watch for tomorrow as clues to how important January 6th will be politically going into the midterms? One of the issues I'll be looking at is what you just mentioned. The degree to which Democrats try to link January the 6th to this legislative push about protecting voting rights. We've already seen prominent people like Senator Klobuchar do that. Will President Biden mention that in his remarks? I think that's key. Also, separate from what's happening behind me on the Capitol, Leland, of course, we have had the former president, President Trump, cancel his scheduled news conference on the day. And I think that is interesting in and of itself. Yeah, at least from the sense that President Trump is, I can't ever remember him canceling something or shying away. The idea that he's, that he's sort of realizing that it's a, it, talking about it's a lose-lose is a, an important note. Uh, Niall, great points. We're glad to have had you. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, good to see you. By most accounts, the economy is booming, but most Americans, eh, they're a little worried about their own pocketbooks. We're going to talk about the disconnect next. And tonight on Prime, a young father and husband, Chance Engelbert, vanishes in a tiny town in Nebraska. Marnie Hughes has more on that at 9, 8 Central. Now, by now, you've heard of the great American resignation, Americans quitting their jobs in record numbers. Now we have the great American sick out, employees calling out sick due to the surge in COVID cases. Stores are forced to change hours. United Airlines paid their pilots three times their normal rate for picking up trips for sick colleagues over the holidays. And they're the lucky ones. They have employees. News Nation's Brian Enton in Miami, where employees, especially for Wawa behind him, are hard to find. Hi, Brian. Yeah, it's a mess. It's not just uh, happening here, obviously, in Florida, Leland. It is all over the country, and it is every single uh, industry. You mentioned United Airlines. The airlines obviously get a lot of attention because of all the flight cancellations, uh, but it's impacting retail really, really hard. Uh, Macy's had to cut back on store hours. Uh, Walmart has had to actually close several stores because workers were not able to come to work. They called in sick, and they did deep cleans at those stores. Uh, and working on this all day, really the saddest part of it all is the small businesses. You've got business owners with 10 or 15 employees. When five people call in sick, they almost have to close down the doors uh, to the business, especially restaurants. Listen to what some of uh, the workers told us. We're already struggling to get people hired and to get people actually to even apply. We're having the issues of servers and, and team members getting sick and not being able to come in for their shifts as well. Double whammy. We've got a lot of people missing today. Um, we're missing a few people in the kitchen as well. It's definitely tough. And yes, I am in front of Wawa, the convenience store uh, chain. They are trying to hire 2,000 people in Florida alone right now. You can imagine how difficult that is. There is already this workforce shortage, and now all of these people calling in sick, uh, they're having a challenge. Uh, they're having to increase wages and have all sorts of things to, uh, to entice people to come and apply for the jobs. Leland? Yeah, Wawa, though, is so much more than a convenience store, Brian, as you and I both know and appreciate. It's a convenience store in the oh, best yeah. possible way. Yeah, it's phenomenal. All right, Brian. Yeah, it's amazing. And by the way, go ahead. One, one of the things, if you, if you take a job at Wawa, you get a free Wawa sub for every shift you work. So that's one of the big incentives here. Uh -huh. So if you love Wawa. That is a pretty big incentive. All right, get a Wawa sub. Yeah. We'll see you later in the night. Thanks.
see it. Companies stepping up their hiring last month. Private job growth hitting 807,000 jobs in December. That's ADP's, the payroll operator's latest report, much higher than analysts had predicted. But despite those job numbers, rising prices continue to burden American consumers. Joining us now, Trish Regan, host of The Trish Regan Show on Spotify, Apple iTunes, and wherever you find your podcast. Trish, uh, good to see you. What's going on here? Brian says Wawa can't hire, but ADP says almost ha you know, a million people got jobs in December. Yeah, <laughs> good to see you too, Leland. Look, I, I would just say that the ADP report sometimes has some fluctuations that eventually get ironed out. We'll see how it all really shakes out. Look, I think the reality is employers are having a hard time finding employees. That's just what's happening right now. People, um, they saved a lot of money. They got a lot of stimulus checks. They got used to a, a new kind of lifestyle and they're being extremely discriminating about where they're, where they're willing to go to work and how they're willing to go to work and whether they're even gonna go into an office these days. And so employees as a result kind of hold all the cards. Employers are trying uh, to, to figure out how they can get them in the door. I mean, the, the strange thing about all of it is that the economy is still going. I mean, I was just away on a ski trip and the place was packed, absolutely packed. And the resort told me the hardest thing of all was just finding employees. They couldn't keep as many restaurants open. They couldn't keep as many stores open as they wanted to. They couldn't have the same kind of housekeeping services that they were used to because they didn't have enough employees. And so, you know, at some point, I guess employers are gonna have to make a decision. And if it's smart enough, to to hire that extra employee for more money. In other words, if they get enough of a return, right. then I guess they'll do it. Right. But, but in the if, meantime, if, we're if, in this sort of no man's land. Yeah, but if employees are getting paid more, they're getting these bonuses, $15 an hour at Wawa, plus free college tuition, plus all the other benefits that so many other employers are offering. You even said employees hold all the cards, yet three out of four Americans in the latest CNBC poll say the economy isn't good. When's it ever been better for employees? Yeah, well, it's not good because they're paying so much more for everything. So if you are sitting home and living off your savings, you suddenly are, are recognizing, wow, the cost of everything is going up. And I'm sorry, it, it just doesn't, ma I mean, look, if you're, if you're very, very wealthy or well off, it doesn't matter. But, you know, for, for everyday people, when you're filling up your gas tank and it costs that much more, you're aware of it, right? Because that extra money means you can't do something else. And so inflation really hurts. It hurts the poor and middle-class Americans truly the most. And so I think that's what's being reflected. Yes, they hold all the cards and that they could go get the job. Maybe they don't wanna get the job. Maybe they are making lifestyle choices where they, they've got to change, but nonetheless, they still recognize that the price of everything has gone up. I mean, it's 59% more to heat your home this year than it was last. And so that reality, Leland, is really sinking in. Yeah, it is a reality, um, and people see it every day, so they feel it a lot more than seeing an incremental increase uh, in their paycheck. Hey, Trish, great conversation. Uh, as a pro, you'll understand we gotta, we got to run. we got one more segment to get in before the end of the hour. But we'll see you soon, all right? You got it. Thanks. It's good to have you. Well... This will make you not care about inflation. Lottery prize pools are going up. So if you win, you get a whole lot more money. But it's harder to win, especially the big jackpot that's coming up. We'll explain why next. Still have a couple of hours to buy your Powerball ticket tonight for the ninth largest jackpot ever. $630 million, a far cry from the $1.6 billion of 2016. That was the record. And, of course, with inflation, $630 million doesn't buy you what it used to, and it's also harder than ever to win. Before 2015, players picked five numbers between 1 and 59 and then one Powerball number between 1 and 35. Now each player picks five numbers between 1 and 69 and then one Powerball number between 1 and 26. Doesn't sound like a lot. But what was already impossible is 50% harder, from 1 in 175 million to 1 in 292 million. As my father told me, really with a lottery ticket, you are just buying the right to dream. My father also told that to his favorite daughter, now professor of data science at Washington University, features editor of the Harvard Data Science Review, 
Liberty Vittert here to explain. Uh, all right, uh, 100, one in 175 million to one in 292 million seems kind of academic in the chances to any individual, right? Well, sure, but it's a big difference in terms of the chance that you have to win. And the reason the lottos did this is because less people were playing. So they needed to extract more money from less people. So how do you do that? You make the jackpot a lot harder to win so that it keeps rolling over every week. The jackpots get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we talk about them on the news. So people go and buy more tickets. I might even buy a ticket myself for $630 million. So they made it a lot harder to win the jackpot. You, you say the you, you, say you might, but why wouldn't you? Well, you wouldn't because basically what the lotto is, is a tax on the poor. Um, it's really the biggest silent tax we have on the poor in the country. And at the same time, when we think of the lotto as being our money is going to go to a good cause because we thought it was going to be to fund education, you'll learn that when you lose, it doesn't actually go to a good cause. It doesn't go to funding education. Yeah, we, we have this graphic up that the, the education budgets just haven't gone up by the amount of that the, the lottery promised uh, that it would. It just goes to the lot of money goes to other stuff. You say it's a tax on the poor. Is that just because more folks who are lower income play it? Well, more people who are lower income, four time, more than four times play the lottery than higher income households. And the lotto counts on people who they call super users. So 80% of the lotto's revenue comes from the same people using it over and over and over again. So it truly is a tax on the poor, especially when you don't understand the numbers and what the real chances are that you're going to win, which is that you're not going to win. Yeah, well, yeah, hey, but you know what? You, you can't win if you don't play. So we'll ask it this way. If you do play, we'll put the graphic up of your chances. Is it better to play the same numbers every time there's a big jackpot or just do uh, the quick pick? And yes, I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, asking for a friend. Um, are you going to share the lotto with me if you win after I We'll uh, see how good you your how answer is. Yeah, uh, the best thing you can do is randomly pick. Um, the best way to think about it is random numbers. It's always random. There's a new lotto every time. It's a new game. And just because numbers came up before doesn't mean they're going to come up again or come up less. So we always want to do the random All right. pick. Well, well, the tickets are two bucks, so I'll give you a dollar for the ticket you're going to buy next time I see you, all right? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. They're still selling them in Florida. Well. Our best of luck to Dan Abrams in the lottery and his show, which is coming up next. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.